is my last lecture for the semester. Um, it's not your last lecture for the semester. We assume it will be uh, covering the remainder of the class. <clears throat> and that means basically we're going to conclude with some results on randomized algorithms today. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't enough time to go through all the details of proofs and analysis for random matrices. Uh, I would have wished to do that, but there's just not enough time. So all I can do today is give you a more high level overview of some of the ways how you can get some of those results. And then, yeah, basically uh, the rest, and, and just give you pointers for the rest. Those papers are not easy reading. Uh, so, and they are long papers too. But you might actually find them beneficial eventually. Uh, okay. Any questions about what we had for last week so far? Uh, anything that was unclear? Okay. So one thing. Um, so next week, so on May the 2nd, uh, so the project presentations are due, and also the submissions of the notes. So the, the project you know. presentations will be on Tuesday during the recitation, so starting this Friday. Okay. So we'll Ina, Ina sent out a fairly detailed email to everybody with the exact timing and schedule. So please read that email. Because you're probably not going to remember dates that I mentioned right now anyway. But basically, the recitation will be used for project presentations. So then for a change, Ina and Yuxian get to sit back and relax and listen to your presentations as opposed to the other way around. Right. So I hope they work out well. And well, good luck with that. So OK. Good. So the things that I'm going to cover today is first of all, I'll wrap up a little bit more on the random matrix tools. And once we're through with that, I'll talk a bit about concentration of major inequalities for matrices. And for the latter, essentially, already something to put in the back of your mind, well, we can usually quite easily get uniform convergence guarantees for entries in a matrix. As a matter of fact, that's what we exploited for the low dimensional embedding algorithms, right? Where we essentially took a distance matrix, square distance matrix, approximated it by some other matrix generated by lower rank objects. And then we showed that point-wise, those two matrices were close. The more interesting thing would be to see whether or not just the matrices are close, element-wise, but also whether they are close in terms of you know, their range, in terms of their eigenvalues, all these properties. Basically, does the matrix as an object that's different from just a gigantic array of numbers converge? And I'll show you some results re with regard to that. OK. So before I do that, though, I'll quickly want to mention the Nystrom method. And for that, recall that there were a couple of approximations that we made in order to go uh, to low rank approximations. So when we had a Hermitian matrix, in other words, M is M star, so transpose complex conjugate, then our simple algorithm for probing the subspace and so on could actually be simplified even further. So I would start with A equals, you know, M times omega. And I would then go and, well, basically decompose this in a QR factorization. I would then form a matrix B. Because Q is now a good guesstimate of what the range is of the following form, Q transposed M Q. And I would then obtain a eigenvector eigenvalue decomposition, V transposed lambda V. And then furnished with that, I can very easily find an approximation of Q to be Q V transposed lambda V Q transposed. 
And what we saw is that this type of algorithm will give us a two epsilon approximation, provided that the projection onto the subspace was a one epsilon approximation. Okay. So the natural, I mean, basically our algorithm got a lot simpler because now I only need to run uh, an eigensolver on this very small matrix as opposed to beforehand running SVD on a larger object. Uh, and we paid something for it. So the question is, can you do this without paying the factor of two? Basically, can we get a you know, rank K approximation that allows us to essentially perform an operation of this form without you know, paying the factor of two? And this is actually possible. And I quickly want to show you the basic var variant of this. And then we'll just extend to the more general one. And this is something called an ice method. And I need to add to that, this only works when this matrix M is actually positive semi-definite. And this is for M being positive semi-definite. So the simplest way to think about this is I might want to approximate, and this is variant one, is basically interpolative decomposition. So in other words, I am interested in something of the form that M is approximately a matrix M in K, some other matrix here in the middle, and then M in K transposed, where, K, where I, what I've done is I've basically picked out a couple of random columns, let's say, from M. So this gives me M and K. So it's N dimensions here and K there. And then I have to pick a suitable matrix Q such that this is a good approximation. OK. So rather than deriving this the numerical analysis route, which you can read up in any decent numerical analysis book, I'm going to give you a quicker and faster, uh, a quicker approximation uh, to get the same result. And the reason I'm doing this is also because it brings back some ideas about kernels. So recall that if we have this, we can actually write the entries mij can be written as phi of xi transposed phi of xj. Actually, I'm just going to refer to them as phi i and phi j. Right. And now what this really amounts to is to say, well, I'm going to approximate any phi i by a linear combination of some phi tildes that are taken from a set of k different entries. Right. So the goal is. Approximate phi i by a linear combination over beta i j, j going from 1 to k. And without loss of generality, I'm just assuming that I'm picking the first few columns phi j. Okay. So nothing easier than that. All I have to do is just minimize over beta the squared norm of this. Okay. So now, if I have to do, is everybody okay with that part of the reasoning? So what I'm doing is I'm explicitly going into feature space by using those phi's. And I'm now saying in this feature space, there shall be an approximation using k of these terms, which amounts to picking k of those columns in such a way that that difference is minimized. Okay. 
So let's take derivatives, right? So d beta i dot. And this is the first term goes away. For the second term, we now get 2 times k i and dot times beta i and dot. So this is basically the ith slice here. Right? And then, so I actually have a minus, and I get a plus 2, uh, sorry, I there's no beta here, obviously. So I'm already taking derivatives. Plus 2 k little k k k. Sorry, no political affiliation intended. Beta i here. Okay. Good. So, in other words, I need to solve this to be zero. Well, nothing's easier than that. What I get, therefore, is that beta i in dot is, because the twos go away, the minus lets us flip this over here, is basically k i in dot times now this matrix, k, k, little k, inverse. Or transpose depending on how you see the vector. Right. So this means that the overall expression for beta is just k n k times k k k inverse, <clears throat> which then in turn lets me actually write the entire approximation of M as follows. It's approximately by M N K times, now I have this K, sorry, it's actually turns into an M, sorry, M, K, K, inverse times, now I have an inner product matrix between those guys, so I get M, K, K again, times M, K, K, inverse, that's for the right hand side, times M, N, K, transpose. And obviously, this goes away. And so we have the Nystrom approximation. This is probably a bit different from how you would have usually seen it. And that's basically just pick a random subset of entries in M, basically same set of rows and columns, invert by this matrix, and then extra, you know, extrapolate. So, this is a rank k approximation. It's very fast to find um, the reference to this for the vanilla version of the algorithm would be Williams and Seeger. And this would be, I think, 2001. And then there is a paper that I wrote with Bernard Scholkopf. And it's at the same year. And the main difference between ours and what they did is we actually used a randomized algorithm to pick the next column one at a time. And we used basically this 5995 trick. So remember, we talked about that maybe about a month ago. So you basically pick one extra, well, you pick 59 directional candidates at a time, then you take the one that's best which turns out to be a little bit expensive to compute. Better strategy is actually 
the paper by Scheinberg and Fine. So as in, this is superior to these two, and that's, I think, 2003, and it's in JMLR. And they basically pivot by the next largest element because you can construct this decomposition incrementally. Okay. Any questions about that so far? Okay. So if you squint at this hard enough, right, let me just write it out again. This is M times some projection matrix Q. times, now here we have Q transposed M Q times Q transposed times M. Where this projection matrix has a very special form. The very special form is that it has only a couple of non-zeros, maybe here, 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 here. And so in doing so, it selects a couple of columns. It's obviously a matrix where each of the columns are orthogonal to each other. They have unit length. So it's, a, it's the most sparse way how you could actually construct such a matrix of orthogonal columns. And it's applied to the same thing here, and then that's what you get. Uh, any questions? Okay. Um, so, this is the special case of the Nystrom method where you actually go and pick columns. Now, the extension to the slightly more general case is where you pick this Q to reflect the actual space on which, on the dominant subspace on which M acts. So you're going to replace this Q by a dense matrix which can be found according to this procedure up here. And if you do this, you regain the factor of 2. So <clears throat> what you basically do is you would end up approximating M by, well, Q transposed M Q to the 1 half, which is basically just taking its Kolesky factor times Q transposed M transposed times the same thing here. That's the overall strategy. So this has the same order as that simple algorithm, but it has a better subspace property. Because in, in that case, I'm just guessing that a couple of columns are meaningful. So Mu, for instance, has a nice paper uh, on interpolative decompositions. Uh, but here it's very, very simple. You just pick a couple of them at random. Um, there are better algorithms than that where you can actually show that picking things greedily isn't too bad. And that would be a paper by Das and Kempe. I think 2010 ICML. And they got the best paper price for that. And the analysis is highly non trivial. It's basically mostly about introducing approximate submodularity and then showing that, for, uh, that approximate submodularity holds under some reasonable conditions and then working the entire argument through. I'm simplifying things probably quite a bit here, but this is just to give you a general idea of the context of where these methods are situated. What is the, the, the key assumption that you need to make on the matrix M in order for the, for, for instance, nice method to work well? OK. What's the key assumption? Well, um, in practice, if you have a rapidly decaying spectrum, then pretty much anything you do will work well. Um, that's uh, being very ham-fisted. There are actually slightly more 
uh, general results in the Halker, Martins, and Trop paper, for instance, which basically give you a statement which goes like order square root number of terms that you've picked and so on. So you're basically getting sort of concentration of major result. Now, um, it's, it's, th these are very uh, unsophisticated results, but if you, for instance, have eigenvalues that decay exponentially, then it doesn't really matter how good your guarantees are. Even some okay-ish guarantees will be good enough because your eigenvalues decay f faster. Now, you would wonder, well, when do I ever get that lucky? Well, actually, you do quite often because one thing that you can show, and for an excruciating derivation, have a look at my thesis, is if I have a kernel of the form x, x and x prime is kappa of x minus x prime, then I can just perform a Fourier transform of kappa and look at its behavior in terms of omega. And with some modifications, additions, and details and constraints, essentially the speed at which the spectrum decays in omega is how the eigenvalues should decay in x uh, on, on that original matrix. At least this gives you an upper bound. The reasoning how this works is you can basically, if the Fourier transform decays rapidly, you can put essentially an approximate bounding box with an ellipsoid or you know, just a box with decaying side links around your data. And therefore, if you have that bounding box and you know that these links decay rapidly, then you also know that the eigenvalues cannot uh, be much slower than that. They could only be faster because you could just be you know, sitting in the subspace. So they don't give you lower bounds but upper bounds. And for instance, if you have a Gaussian RBF kernel, then we know that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So we basically have the squared exponential decay. So this is also why if you, for instance, use a Gaussian RBF kernel on data in practice, a moderately low dimensional approximation will be good enough to pretty much get all the interesting bits out of you know, that kernel, which is why all those low ranker approximations work really well for Gaussians. On the other hand, if you have something that decays very slowly, you might need more terms. So this is the really high level reasoning why in some cases you don't actually need to be particularly good at theoretically bounding this because even if you have a terribly loose bound, if your eigenvalues decay faster than this loose bound, you're still safe. Um, well, that's maybe not exactly what you'd like to hear as a theorist, but in practice it's actually very good news. You don't have to be smart to do well in this case. Okay. Um, any question? Any more questions about this? So, one thing that I should briefly mention, and quite honestly, I think those methods are ever so slightly bizarre, um, but sometimes you may need them. Are what's called single pass methods. So single pass method, so if you think about it, all those algorithms so far required us to go through the same matrix at least twice. And there are some situations where you may only be able to afford looking at that matrix once. Maybe because it arrives in a streaming fashion, or maybe because, well, you want to, pr want, want to write a paper about a single pass method. I cannot really see a lot of practical situations where two passes would be a lot worse than a single pass. But I guess some other people feel differently about that. In any case, the basic idea is, of course, if you have that term here, right? And you get this expression here, there then you could also apply, I mean, we basically know this, we know that, we can apply this term here. So what this would do is, it would allow us then to again solve a linear system of equations to reverse infer what m might have been in a projected representation. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I don't think it's particularly useful, but I'll just give you the basic idea. So once you have that so, so what you basically do is you then use numerical linear algebra 
to re-guess what the original matrix would have been had it been projected onto a low dimensional space. And then you do all the subsequent operations on that. The reason why I really don't like this is because it's hideously computationally expensive. It introduces all sorts of numerical instabilities by having to solve a linear system of equation and then running an eigenvalue solver on the solution of that. It's just, yeah, you really don't want to do this unless you have an extremely strong reason why the rest isn't possible. So I'm not going to even show you the details. Okay. What I'm going to show you, though, is a couple of guarantees. Um, so there were some questions that came up last time. Well, you know, some of the guarantees have the size of the matrix in there. And if that happens, isn't that bad. And yes, in general, it's not nice. So here's a couple more guarantees. And there's probably about a dozen of them in different conditions and flavors and variants in the Halco, Martinson, and Trop paper and in subsequent work. So let me just give you a selection of what you can get. So one is, for instance, that the expectation of the difference as in terms of the Frobenius norm between the matrix and the projection Q, Q transposed M, that this thing here is less equal than 1 plus K over phi minus 1 to the 1 half. And then sum over j equals k plus 1 to n sigma j squared to the 1 half. And this is assuming that we solve the problem not for a k by k problem, but for a k plus p dimensional problem. So I'm, in other words, I'm oversampling by p extra dimensions. So that's a key aspect that can make your life easier. By just adding a few extra dimensions, you don't pay much for it. But you can actually, this way, make sure that you at least got the, you know, the first k singular values right up to. Um, so it has a lot to do with if I take a large Gaussian random matrix, then the smallest eigenvalues can actually be pretty ugly. But everything but the smallest ones are actually going to be less ugly. And that's sort of kind of what you exploit here. Um, so in other words, if I take you know, an n by n Gaussian, so a k by k Gaussian random matrix, uh, well, the smallest singular values are very ugly. If I oversample by a few, then they behave a lot nicer. And I'll give you a guarantee for that in a moment. And if you don't like the Frobenius norm, then you can have a similar statement in the matrix norm. And now you get something that looks a little bit different. It's basically 1 plus square root k over p minus 1. So very similar growth behavior. Sigma k plus 1 plus e times square root k plus p over p. So similar behavior, except that it's slightly better in the oversampling. And now you have sum equals j equals one, k plus 1 up to n sigma j squared to the 1 half. So in other words, if I only have a small number of dominant singular values and I've knocked them out, then the error is really only a function of whatever is left after I've removed those dominant singular values. Okay. Um, if they decay slowly, then this is bad news. So let's look at the slow decay first. For the slow decay, this will behave like, you know, sigma k plus 1 times square root n minus p. And this is actually what we had uh, last week, where somebody said, yeah, this is awful. And indeed, this is awful. Um, on the other hand, with basically, they all pretty much stay the same. But in that case, you really don't have much legitimate business anyway 
in performing low rank approximations because suppose I give you the identity matrix and I tell you to perform a low rank approximation, no matter what you do, you're going to get garbage, right? You're basically using the wrong tool to approximate the mm -hmm. system. There may be something where the factors are sparse and you have much higher rank might be more meaningful. As a matter of fact, this is a criticism that you can actually also levy against, uh, for instance, recommender systems. A lot of recommender systems use low rank approximations of gigantic matrices. So for instance, what you can do, and I'm guilty of the same crime, and in our case it was for bragging rights rather than for anything statistically meaningful, you can take gigantic graphs of maybe 200 million, maybe a billion vertices, and perform a 100 dimensional low rank approximation of it. You can do it to show that your algorithm actually scales to those numbers, but the insight that you get from it in terms of statistics is, yeah, quite meaningless because you can almost certainly assume that, that such large graphs have more than 100, mil, 100 eigenvalues that are non-trivial. Think of the Facebook graph. Probably a lot of you are friends on Facebook with each other. It's a good chance that everybody is friends with some people from his maybe elementary school, high school, and so on. So if you just count the total number of schools that there are, uh, that is a lot larger than 100. And each of those form a subblock, so you can immediately see that the connectivity matrix is going to be much closer to something that you know has overlapping blocks, rather than something that is low rank. So in other words, your social graph doesn't look like so. Well, it looks more like so after reordering. And it definitely doesn't look like so. And this is, by the way, what recommender systems do. This is what you should be doing. For instance, the Indian buffet process is actually a pretty nice tool for that. So this is actually a much more suitable way of modeling graphs. So this is just as a small detour. So this is a bad case, but you shouldn't be using this tool for that bad case in the first place. Now let's assume that the eigenvalues decay actually really rapidly. So that, you know, the sigma j's are some lambda to the j for lambda in 0, 1. And this expansion here, this one here, can be lower bounded by, well, sigma k times 1 over square root of 1 minus lambda squared. That's just the standard, you know, geometric power series. Right? So now, this sum actually doesn't really depend on n anymore. This could go to infinity. I mean, that's the upper bound for that. So I've just written this as, you know, sigma k times and then, you know, 1 plus lambda plus one plus lambda squared plus lambda to the four, da, 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 da. And the square root comes from that. So in this case, you get an approximation of matrices of arbitrary sizes that don't depend on the size of the matrix mm -hmm. anymore, which is a very nice thing. In practice, you of course would never really bother about this. You just run the algorithm and check. Never rely on the theory if you can actually check. Um, but it's nice to have. Okay, so that's that. Then there are also tail bounds. And there seems to be some rather big disagreement between some of the authors on, on these papers as to the relative use of the tail bounds. It's kind of funny that, so uh, Joel Tropp, basically one of his main businesses is to prove tail bounds for everything related to matrices. And then Martinson actually has this very explicit statement, due to the overwhelming concentration of measure effects in this case, the expected quantities are the only thing you really care about, and things are so well concentrated anyway that, you know, why would you even bother writing the guarantees up? Okay. Um, 
which might also tell you who wrote which part of the paper. Okay. So there's one last piece that I should probably mention. Uh, I mean, just to give you a flavor of how you can get some of those results, one of the key properties is that for Gaussian random matrices, so for drawn from a normal distribution, you have the following nice guarantees. Um, the expected value of well, the pseudo inverse in this case, because they're actually, you know, larger matrices. So basically, omega is in R k times k plus p. The pseudo inverse so one half equals, and this can be expressed explicitly, k over p minus 1. So that's kind of nice. And if you pick up a book on random matrix theory, a classical book, this would have it in it. Um, so these are fairly old results. But what it basically tells you is that as soon as I start oversampling this matrix even just a little bit, right? I'll get something where the Frobenius norm of the pseudo inverse is actually very well behaved. So I don't, I won't basically get any of those division by zero effects, which is good news. And if I don't like a Frobenius norm but a matrix norm, I'll get something similar. And there you only get an inequality, this E times square root K plus P over P. So it means that those matrices are extremely well behaved. Because of course the matrix norms themselves are quite small. So this makes things good. That basically gives you a good guesstimate of the condition number of those matrices. And that's why it's mostly safe to invert with them. One or two other tools that you may want to use in this context, that's, and we'll actually pick this up again uh, for generic matrices. If I have Gaussian random matrices, then if I have a function, have some function h with a property that h of x minus h of y, where these guys are now matrices, there's a mapping to the reals, is less equal than, let's say, x minus y in Frobenius norm. So this is a Lipschitz condition on matrices. And in this case, it's, I'm just treating this function as a function which takes each number separately, right? So this is, this is very simple, right? Then, if this is effectively the norm between the coefficients, then I have that the probability that h of x is much larger than its expected value Right. plus some L times epsilon is less equal than E to the minus epsilon squared over 2. So you can now immediately see what could be done here. For instance, if these have a Lipschitz constant, then I can immediately also get a tail bound. So that's the type of flavor that you get. So this behaves very much like a Höfting bound, except that you now have matrices. Okay. Good. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit. And there's actually an excellent short talk by Lester Mackey. So his slides are up online 
on Stein's method for matrix concentration. And what I'm going to give a very brief overview over is largely based on those notes. I'll add a few more details. And essentially, this is about the following. Suppose I have some matrix X, which, you know, is drawn from some distribution P of X. Then what I'm interested in is the probability that, you know, X minus the expected value of X, right? But this is greater or equal than some epsilon. And I want to make sure that this is less equal than delta. And in a way, I can express it like so. I can also, so I can, could have a Frobenius norm here. Or I could specifically ask about the largest uh, singular value of that difference. More specifically, a lot of what follows here will be with regard to positive semi-definite matrices. So a useful corollary out of this would be, for instance, suppose I'm interested in doing principal component analysis, and I'm summing over terms as follows. So I have basic sum over i, xi, xi transposed, 1 over n, i equals 1 to n. Then the question is, how rapidly does this converge to the expectation of x, x transposed, right? So basically, how many, you know, outer products do I need to sum up until I can be reasonably confident that I'm close? Yep? Uh, is there any easy way to sample from the previous space? Uh, that's a very good question. The question in this, okay, well, let, let, let me give you an, an answer that might help you to some extent. So first of all, there's something called a Wishart distribution. Okay. Okay. And this actually describes a distribution over positive semi-definite matrices. And in particular, it looks at as follows. It basically assumes that we have a hierarchical Bayesian model where you first draw covariance matrices and means from that gauss wishart distribution. So it's actually called a gauss wishart And then you uh, use this to draw data from it. But the only thing that you're really observing is the data. So this is the equivalent of a binomial distribution with, a con with that its conjugate being the Dirichlet. So you first draw the, you know, well, the multinomial distribution from the Dirichlet, and then you draw the samples from the multinomial, or from a gamma Poisson model, right? So you first draw the rate parameter from the gamma, and then you draw samples from the Poisson. Same thing can be done here. So if you want to know this in its full excruciating and gory details, do the following thing. So you have a laptop open. Search for the following thing and bookmark that page. Old Kiwi. Yes, like so. And Gauss Wishart. And you'll probably have to zoom out on your uh, browser to make the entire equation fit on the screen. Okay. Um, what they did is basically old Kiwi because this is some probably partially defunct website now in New Zealand. And the Kiwi bird comes from there, right? Uh, the Kiwi fruit actually not really. I think it's actually a Chinese origin and the New Zealanders adopted it and bred it. But anyway, search for this. Make a copy while it's still available. It's also in Fukunaga's book from the 60s in detail. <laughs> So here's what happens. Usually when, P, when you search for the Wishart distribution, for instance, if you search for that in Wikipedia, it only spells out the matrix part of the conjugate prior for a Gaussian. 
But a Gaussian has a mean and a covariance. So you need to actually have an expression for both. And the really messy part in the entire expression comes from the fact that you draw the covariance matrix, and then you also need to decide what the mean is. And that, in the distribution of the mean, is partially governed by which covariance matrix you picked in the first place. That's the interesting part. This arises from the fact that you're really specifying your conjugate, not in terms of mean and covariance, but in terms of the conjugate for the first and second order moments. Right? So a Gaussian, okay, just a very quick detour. Okay, we, a Gaussian is given with, with using sufficient statistics of the form minus 1 half x, x transposed, and x. It's an exponential family distribution using this. So then you need means for these two parameters to specify it. And this is exactly what you get to the Gauss Richard. Okay. So for further details, read this up and um, yeah, enjoy. Good. So. Now, let's look at matrices. So the key part in what they introduce, and this simplifies a lot of the derivations relative to what I've seen before, and simplifies the relative expression here, is something called a matrix Stein pair. And this is actually a very ingenious construction. In general, Stein pairs are. And I'm actually surprised that they are not in more widespread use in a lot of uh, uniform con convergence analysis in machine learning, because they are actually a very reasonable alternative to what people typically use as a ghost sample. And I'll get to that in a moment. Basically, a ghost sample is something where you have, let's say, 1 over n, sum over i, xi, minus the expectation over x i over x and you want to bound this then what you typically do is you would write this as the expectation over 1 over n sum over x i prime i going from 1 to n and typically you have some convex function here and you have some expectation over x outside this is typically how the, those bounds go. And what you then do is you replace this, which is starts perfectly fine. So this is the ghost sample because it never existed. So that trick, I think, can be traced back to Vapnik and Chevonenkis, 1971. Ghost sample. Go here. So you have this convex term. And then you usually upper bound things by pulling the expectation in x in x prime out, which for a convex function is fine. You then get 1 over n of these terms. I mean, usually you have some functions of this, so I'm just sketching out the idea. Minus 1 over n expectation. Uh, sorry, 1 over n sum over i going from 1 to n xi prime. Then at some point you exploit the fact that these are drawn from the same distribution. So I can switch them around and I get some swapping permutations and that's essentially how your analysis goes. So this is the typical ghost sample idea. Now what the matrix time pair allows you to do is look at a lot more sophisticated ways of varying your observations in such a way that this variation leaves things unchanged in terms of the probability distribution. So rather than 
what I showed here, you could, for instance, have a sampling without replacement. So leave one out type guarantees that you could probably obtain with this. So there's a lot more that can be done there. Could be quite fun to actually analyze this. So, okay, what is a matrix Stein pair or what is a Stein pair in general? So you start with some exchangeable pair. Z, Z prime. In other words, P of Z, Z prime is the same thing as P of Z prime Z. Okay? So this trick goes back, the Stein pairs go back to Saurav Chatterjee. I think he did that in his PhD thesis. And I then get some, get x and x prime as some functions psi of z and psi of z prime. So they don't have to be independent, but they need to be exchangeable. That's the important thing. So that's like a reversible Markov chain in a way. Right? So as a matter of fact, that connection might be quite fun exploring as well. Maybe it's already been done, but if not, this might be quite fun. Okay. So it's, and the condition is as follows. The expectation of x minus x prime given z is alpha times x. So in other words, if I go and just compare x and x prime, conditioned on z, which pretty much tells me x, then that difference can't be very large. And moreover, it's going to be expressed to some extent in terms of x. So this will then allow me to get very nice self-bounding inequalities, in other words, which go along the form of, well, my variance is large if my matrices are large, if the matrices are small, the variance is also small with high probability. So that kind of statements are kind of make intuitively a lot of sense, but they're not that easy to prove. Um, so I'm just going to show a couple of basic properties of this. So the first thing is going to be that the expected value of x is zero. Um, for, first of all, I mean, of course, x and x prime are exchangeable because I just applied the same function to z and z prime, so therefore x and x prime are exchangeable. Now to show that the expected value of x is zero, I need to basically compute the expected value of x. Effectively over z, right? So this is the same thing as by just using that very inequality, one over alpha, because I can push it over here, the expected value over z. And here I have the expected value over x minus x prime given z. And now using, so this is over x prime. So now using the fact that I can just pull both expectations out and so I get expectation over x minus x prime, since they are drawn from the same distribution, as I, since they're exchangeable, I can switch them around, so therefore by symmetry, it follows that this equals zero. So that's a very simple proof of this property. You can actually use this quite a bit later on. So to make things a bit more concrete, let's look at one of those time pairs. I could, for instance, have as x to be given by 1 over n um, sum over i going from 1 to n zi, where these are positive semi-definite matrices, and x prime given z is basically with equal probability 1 over n zi prime minus z 
pi. So I'm basically swapping one of them out plus x. Um, and basically, i is uniformly between 1 and n. Okay. So in other words, my way of perturbing x now is that I just take one observation out, I replace it by something else, and I look at how things change. This, by the way, is also what's underlying a lot of the stability bounds in machine learning, where you basically go and say, well, suppose I perturb a single observation, how much do things change? And typically, the way how people do this is they look at the worst case change, basically the single worst observation that could foul things up. And then I get, obviously, worst case guarantees in terms of that. That feels actually utterly wrong because, well, suppose there's only always a tiny number of observations that can change things a lot, and most of them don't, then you would expect that your worst case bounds should be a lot better. And that your bounds should be a lot better. And as a matter of fact, that's, for instance, behind the reasoning in support vectors, where when you solve a support vector optimization problem, you end up with a small number of support vectors, you get good guarantees. Simply because of the fact that you could actually replace a lot of them without really changing the solution at all. And this is a very clean way of looking at this problem by saying, well, hey, I'm going to look at the average perturbation that I get by you know, picking any one of those terms at random and checking what happens. There are a lot of other Stein pairs that you can construct, but that's basically the key hammer that you get. So now, once you have this, you need to look at you know, how much do things actually change. And the key quantity there is something which they call conditional variance. And so delta x is defined as, well, actually, delta x of z, really, is defined as 1 over 2 alpha. So remember that alpha that came from here. And here you have the expected value of x minus x prime squared given z. So for convenience, let's actually briefly look at what, the, what alpha is in this case and prove that this is actually a Stein pair. And then we can also work out that variance. So what you can immediately see is that x and x prime are drawn from the same distribution and they're exchangeable. Right? Basically, if I swap i for you know, zi for zi prime, or if I swap zi prime for zi, if they are drawn from the same distribution, everything's good. So basically, those zi's are drawn from the same distribution id. Now, if I have this, therefore I can swap. And since, on average, I'm picking you know, any of those between guys from between i and you know between one and n at random, I get that alpha is one over n. So basically, the expected deviation between x and x prime is exactly x. So that's quite easy. So this is also assuming, of course, that these guys here are zero. So we get alpha is one over n here for this. Now, if you look at that expression here, and if I look at the expectation of the differences, the only difference is that's going to occur, let's just write it out, right, is basically going to be 1 over n, sum over i going from 1 to n. It's actually 1 over n squared, really. Um, zi minus zi prime squared. It's going to be the expectation of that. Okay. So now <clears throat> that we have this, um, we can actually work out this term. So this is nothing else but the expectation 
of set i squared of set i prime squared, but they're drawn from the same distribution, so we get a factor of two here. Then we get the cross terms, they all vanish, so this is really just, well, basically 2 over n expectation of set i squared. Right. That's all that survives. Now alpha was 1 over n. We divide by this, right? We, so 1 over alpha is n. So this entire thing goes away, and we get that. So this makes life easy. Any questions so far? So the first theorem that um, they prove is, and then there's a couple of corollaries, but this is kind of the main result, is that for pairs prime, where delta x, okay, sorry guys, I actually messed this up because this is, we're taking conditional expectations, right, so I'll clean this up in a moment, yeah, actually we get not a factor of two here, this would be to brute force, this would be basically set i. Okay, I'll really write it in a moment. So let, let me first finish writing out this the theorem. Okay, so guys, you need to pay attention because I actually had to condition here on z. That's why I couldn't have pulled this out directly. Okay, so I'll fix this in a moment. Anyway, so assuming that delta x x is upper bounded by cx plus vi, so the identity matrix, for some c and v greater than zero, then the probability that lambda max of x is greater or equal than t is less equal than d times e to the minus t squared over 2v plus 2ct. Okay, so let's look at those various parts because this should look very familiar. So this t squared part is very similar to what we typically have in a hefting bound. Right. This is basic, you know, epsilon squared. This v is an upper range bound. So this is similar to what we typically have, you know, in our hefting bound if we have random variables that are bounded between ai and bi. And so we get ai minus bi squared, and this guy shows up in the denominator. <laughs> this is something that we saw when we looked at the McDiarmid and Reed self-bounding inequalities, for instance. So there's a paper from 2005. Um, and this essentially states that if the random variables are well bounded by you know, the function value, then you get this additional tail. What it basically means is that for large t, this term here will really kick in and you'll get like an e to the minus t behavior. So that means far away from the mean, you get a one over sample size behavior in terms of rate of convergence to the mean. Then as you zoom in, your convergence will slow down to one over uh, square root t, a uh, square root sample size rate. So, in other words, as long as the problem is really easy, you get fast convergence. Once it's really hard to distinguish things, it slows down. So, 
that's also the same thing as, for instance, what you get in the Tsubakov type margin bounds for classification. So when you have a classification problem and say this is your decision boundary and there's some data here, then the rate of convergence at which you converge to the optimal separating decision function has a lot to do with how much data you see here. In other words, how blurred out that boundary is near you know, exactly that line. If this is very blurred out, you have to sample and average a lot to find out exactly where that boundary is. If it's very clean and there's nothing there, or there's only one class or only the other one there, then you get fast rates. So that's essentially where all those you know, denominators come from. It's the same effect over and over, just in very different guises. Okay. okay, be that as it may, what this means is that for you know, matrices which have zero mean, so these are not positive semi-definite, but they're at least symmetric, um, I can get this argument quite easily. So it basically means that, you know, this, so, so how, what, I, what would I do if I wanted to compute, you know, covariance matrices? I'd basically take the difference between xi, xi transposed, and the expectation of xi, xi transposed. This is now a zero mean random variable. And now I need to ask, how quickly does that average of the difference between the empirical estimate and the expectation converge to zero? That's what you can answer with this. And you basically get rates that are as good as, you know, point, con pointwise conversions rates. The only wrinkle in it is this dimensionality dependence, which means basically the larger the matrix you get, you get a log dependence on that. And there's nothing that can be done about this. So you can basically show that this is tight. Okay, now let's fix that mistake that I made over here. Okay. So what we're after, I was just skipping too many steps at once, which is never good. So this is basically n over 2. And now here we have the expectation over those terms. And we can clearly see there's only one of those that can ever kick in at any given time. So I have times 1 over n times the sum of i going from 1 to n, the expectation of said i prime minus said i, okay, that given said i, right, because that's, those are the only terms that are really different. And now since the set i's are already given, right? So that expectation over the set i's is therefore trivial. You just plug it in. The cross terms cancel out. And so what I get is basically 1 half sum over i going from 1 to n expectation. And since their expectations are the same, so I can just swap it. Expectation of set i squared plus set i squared directly. And that's what they actually have in this. And then, yeah, that's the overall quantity here. OK. So that's one of the things that you can use. Now, specific applications is really, you know, if I, for instance, have individual random variables here being having zero mean and the random variables being individually bounded by some upper bound, then I can just plug this in here and I'm done. Uh, what I want to quickly show you is this Laplace transform method of 
essentially that can be traced back to Alsvedi and Winter, how you can actually start proving a guarantee of that form. Because I think that's actually more, more useful than the specifics. Um, any questions so far about this type of statement? So this really has the same form as you know, the AI minus BI constraints on random variables. So if I want to constrain this, I need to make sure that you know, the variance is bounded and that their range is bounded. This is basically what you get in a typical Bernstein bound. And these are exactly the two quantities you need to bound in order to plug in here. And then you get your guarantee. All right. So it's that kind of stuff. Okay. So let me quickly show you how you start the proof. And then it will become a lot more clear why we went through all those exponential inequalities in the past. So the probability that lambda max of some random variable x to be greater or equal than t well what I can do is I can write this as the probability that x of and now here I have lambda max of x times uh, minus t. And I multiply this by theta. So nothing has changed yet. And that this, of course, here is greater or equal than 1. So that's the same trick as what we did already three times in the past. OK. So this <coughs> is less equal than the expectation of x of lambda max of x. And yeah, OK, uh, I can lambda max of x minus t times theta. So same trick as what we had before. And now the only thing is that in order to bound this, I now, because I mean this is a matrix, so we somehow need to turn this into a matrix exponential, right? So And what I could actually do is I, uh, OK. So then this is the same thing as the expectation of lambda max of the matrix exponential. minus uh, well, theta, and of course, here, yep, minus e to the minus theta t. And then, of course, the largest eigenvalue is less equal than sum over all the singular values. So therefore, we get less equal than expectation over the trace of this quantity here. Right. Times e to the minus theta t. And that's it. So the trick is basically you write the statement in terms of the largest singular value. You then exponentiate it as you would. You then pull the largest singular value out from that expression over matrices. And then you replace this by the trace. 
That's the Oswald and Winter argument in a nutshell. Okay. There's probably not enough time to go into a lot of those things in a lot more detail. There is this very nice tutorial by TROP, user-friendly matrix concentration inequalities, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's actually a nice paper. Okay, so look for that. This might be good further reading if you like the subject. And I hope you got something useful out of this class. Um, it was fun for me. I don't know whether it was fun for you guys. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your patience, uh, for putting up with me, and uh, I want to say thanks. Question. Uh, is there an easy explanation for why you explain lambda max interchangeably? Okay, well that's actually reasonably easy to do insofar as if you have exponentials, if you in general have functions of matrices. The way how you can define them is as follows that basically I have f of x is defined as, well, v transposed diag of f of lambda i, right, v. And if you do this, then of course this holds right away. Now, um, in practice, what you can, for instance, do is you can get this if you have a power series. So if you have, you know, your standard Taylor expansion of f, you get powers of the argument. This is where you plug them, those matrices in. So that's why you preferably need Hermitian matrices for this all to go through. Because otherwise, you know, if you have a matrix and you raise it, that's not symmetric and you raise it to a higher power, what exactly is going to happen? Well, if it's a square matrix, you can probably do it. In general, it's a little bit painful. There are a couple of ways how you can make something symmetric. For instance, if I have some arbitrary matrix A, I can take this, A, A transpose, 0, 0, and then try proving statements for this. So that's how you can extend it to more general cases. Um, but well, that's basically how you introduce those functions. And a lot of the nice things about radius of convergence and so on go through. So for instance, you can, for matrices that deviate only slightly from the identity, you can define a matrix logarithm just to that power series as well, and then get nice approximations and so on. So a lot of, this, a lot of the math goes through in interesting ways. So one thing, for instance, that would be quite interesting is so there's something called a Klein inequality, which they also need in the proof of this paper. They actually need the generalized Klein inequality, but the Klein inequality itself is something that's like a simple Bregman divergence type statement. So basically, if I have a convex function, I can define the Bregman divergence uh, between two terms to be simply the, uh, that difference here. So if I do this, so in other words, I get something like f of x prime minus f of x plus f prime of x times x minus x prime. You can make the same statement here in terms of matrices. Well, for a convex function, this is greater or equal than zero. Proving that this holds for matrices is a little bit less trivial. One of the challenges is that, well, you know, if they don't jointly diagonalize, you can just apply to the eigenvalues and say, hey, voila, this is why it holds. But it also holds for matrices. Now, the obvious question, and so with this replaced with semi-definiteness and so on, so this is called the Klein inequality. Now, if you have that, then you could actually ask questions of the form like, well, maybe this would be a nice Bregman divergence between matrices. So except that it's now a more general object. And I don't know whether anybody has studied this, but if not, 
you know, this is probably low, it's probably a low-hanging paper. And then you can do a lot of the Rigman divergence arguments that people have done in general with now matrix-valued objects. Would be a very nice general abstract nonsense paper. Okay, and I think they're probably going to kick me out soon because my time's up. Um, I said I wanted to thank you for, well, putting up with me in this course. And I'm around, so if you have any further questions, um, just, you know, ping me maybe after the summer break as well. Okay, thanks.